Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Jim McGuire, and today we are going to have Mr. Peter Peasy. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Good, Jim. How are you? Good, good. Uh, today we're going to go over uh, case management and material options uh, with Peter. So Peter has been doing uh, several webinars, remote webinars, for a while now uh, in this COVID strange year. We're moving closer to where we can get out in the field and in person, which is uh, excellent. And I know, Peter, you have uh, visited several uh, shows, lab shows and clinical shows, so you're getting to be busy as well out in, in the field. And some new ones coming up. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so before we get going, uh, for the audience, uh, I just want to go over a few items with you. Your phone will be on mute throughout the program. So on the right-hand side of your screen on the panel, there is a question box. So if you have a question, please complete that question, send it in to us. And at the end of the program, we will have a question and answer uh, session. So please send in those questions as you think of them, and we'll categorize them and then let those questions go at the end. The re workshop itself with Peter will be recorded. We are going to have this on the VITA website, whether it's on the YouTube, VITA North America YouTube channel, the Instagram, the uh, LinkedIn, uh, also Facebook. So there will be links for you to go back and revisit this webinar with Peter. And then we will uh, get going on this with uh, Peter. So, Peter, everything is going well for you out in the uh, the world? Can't complain. I'm just crazy busy, but uh, otherwise not so bad. All right. So I am going to make you the presenter, Peter, so you will have control. And you should see the controls now where you can. There we go. I see your PowerPoint. Yeah, my screen, great. Okay. So I'm going to disappear and we'll talk to you later. Sounds great. Thank you, Jim. I'm just going to put this off to the side here. And we're good to go. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome in the, the month of August. So another uh, another month has gone by. It's halfway through August. Everybody's summer is ending. I hope you're having a great summer. Um, and thank you, Jim, for the great topic again. I, I know I think I keep mentioning Jim's been picking a lot of these topics based on emails and things for you. So um, case management and material options, I've kind of really gone through a lot of the materials in the last bunch of webinars, but uh, I'm going to focus a little bit more on kind of looking through the cases, how you walk through them and some of the details that, that, that I go through on a daily basis. So for each case that you do, obviously there are different challenges that you walk through. And I think some of the, the biggest challenges that we're having today in this new aesthetic world is really managing the, the different material options with the case and which case is right for which material, not the other way around, right? I try not to choose the material first. I look at the case and evaluate which, which materials work well for that particular case. So first let's start with some of the most important parts and that's the biology. Um, when I'm looking at my cases, one of the things I'm always concerned about is how much tissue I have, how much bony architecture support there is, and where the teeth belong. And I think it's something that we don't take enough into account as technicians. We tend to think about which material, how light or bright, how fast of a turnaround, strength and hardness, all those things that I think um, almost get redundant, redundant and a little silly after, after a while. So for me, I'm looking at the biology on my cases. Where is the tissue? Can I support it? Can I make it look good? And do I have the bone that I need to give me the tissue that I want and have the support I need? So for me to do that, it usually starts this way. And I'll give you an example of an old case that I did a long time ago. Uh, I remember this case really well because it was a doctor that I didn't know that kind of called me out of the blue and said, you know, uh, I think I saw an article or I saw a lecture and I was wondering if you would do a single central for me. And I think most of you would kind of feel the same way in the sense that, you know, you hear those words out of a doctor's mouth, especially a new doctor, and it's usually, no, thank you, I'm not interested. Um, I dove into the conversation with him a little bit, and, and here are some of the things that I kind of went through in managing this case and managing the aesthetics. For one, look at the adjacent restoration. 
Now, I think you all know that when we work on cases, we're usually matching nature. And when we're matching nature, we have an understanding of nature. We understand dentin, enamel, translucency, shape, and morphology. When I'm matching an old restoration, I don't know what I'm following because I don't know anything about that particular restoration. And I'm sure we could easily critique it, right? The good and bad of it, what we like and don't like about it, probably more dislikes than likes. But if you really look at it, what is it? What ceramic was used? What material was used? How was it cemented? Was it fired once or was it fired 30 times? Did they paint stains on the inside or on the outside? And all these things play a factor because we don't know how to make something like that look similar in the end. So that would be my first challenge. And the first thing I said to the doctor was exactly that. I said, normally I would do a single central. I'm gonna tell you at least twice because I don't always nail them perfectly the first time. In this case, I might be looking at three or four because I have no idea what I'm trying to get to. And that's gonna be a problem. The other option is, why are you matching that other one? <laughs> it looks pretty bad to start with, right? And I think the dentist's opinion was, well, the patient's only paying me for one. So my example was, I get it, but in this scenario, you're gonna see that patient maybe three or four times until we get this to look really the way we want to. How about if I send you two crowns on the next visit and they both go in and you're done in that visit? Isn't that better patient management than trying to chase something that we don't know we should necessarily chase? Now, I wanna be clear. If that was a natural tooth and it was a good looking tooth, of course I wouldn't be pushing him to prepare it. But in this particular case, it's a veneer and an ugly one at that. Why are we saving it? So my words to the doctor were, take it out. Let me do two. I'm going to charge you for two anyway, because I'm going to do it twice in the long run anyway. And put two nice veneers in there. So he went back to the patient, told the patient that what I wanted to do. And the patient's response was, but you know what? I never liked these veneers. I'm glad it was better to do both of them. So it was kind of, kind of a better way if you really got, got into it. So in the end, I made two veneers. Um, you can see there are refractory veneers that are on my, my die at this point with the yellow dye space behind them. And there's a lot of white calcifications to kind of follow what I saw in natural tooth. And I remember when I sent these back, I got a phone call the day that the doctor was inserting them. And his words to me were, Peter, you gave me a black triangle. That was his words to me. And I thought, I gave you a black triangle. How did I do that? If that was my intention to not do a good job on the case. I said, well, do me a favor. Let me take a look at the picture. Send it to me. And he sent me a picture. And this is what I saw. And I said, oh, you know what, Doc? We're fine. Don't worry about it. Matter of fact, I would tell you, go back and take another picture. And let me see what that looks like in five or 10 minutes. And I have a feeling we're going to be OK. And sure enough, five or 10 minutes later, he took another picture and that papel was fine. Now, why was it fine? It was fine because I followed the biology, not just what I thought was right. And the biology is very simple for me. All I want to do is understand where the bone is or where the tissue belongs and then build my restorations around that. Now, there's some simple systems to follow to do that. And an example of the system is, understanding the biological width of the teeth. And I'll kind of run through this a little quickly, but basically it's a simple process for us all to kind of work through as we look at our cases. One, wherever the bone is, you will find tissue approximately three millimeters away. If the bone is not there, the tissue will not be there. So your job as a technician is to make sure that your contact is usually about three to four millimeters away from the bone. I'm gonna say four millimeter contact point to be specific. I want a contact point that's exactly four millimeters away from the bone. Now, I'll be honest and tell you, you have a little freedom in there, and that freedom could be my contact to be four and a half, could almost be five, to be honest. But in an ideal world, how about we pick something in the middle, and the middle for me would be four and a half. So if you made a standard in your laboratory that every restoration you do, you make your contact four and a half millimeters from the bone, you will always have a papilla and you will always have tissue development. The question that most of you are asking though, as I'm saying this right now is, how do you know where the bone is? Well, it's really actually pretty simple. And this is the importance of using a solid cast to understand. So I have two ways that we do this. One, most of my doctors are on the same page as me. And I, if they're not, I would help educate them. And if there are some doctors out there now, I'm sure most of you are already aware of this, but 
the ideal margin placement for the doctor is three millimeters from the crest of bone. And if the doctor follows that three millimeter marginal placement, well, that means all you need to do is measure one and a half millimeters away from the margin. And then you'll always be at a four and a half range. And I say four and a half because I could be four, I could be almost five. That's going to be really more dependent on the type of tissue. But in the end, it at least gives you a, a point to work from. So what's ideal world? Have your doctors prep their, their margins three millimeters from the bone and you'll be safe. If they don't do it, then it's your job to understand where the tissue is. And where the tissue is, don't forget, there'll be some cord pack and some of the pillars push out or fall a little bit, depending on how the, the tissue is managed. But roughly, that papilla is gonna be uh, at a certain level, about three millimeters from the crest of bone. What that allows you to think of is, if that's where my papilla finishes, I just wanna be a millimeter above that on the soft tissue cast or on my solid cast. And that's why we work on solid tissue casts and not just for contacts, they're for managing the aesthetics as we go through the processes. So that's the first part for me is the biology. The second part becomes is how do we manage the spacing once we look at the biology of the patient. And these are where they become more challenges because when I'm looking at teeth, I'm not only looking at them aesthetically, but I'm looking at them from a functional point of view. And this particular case was an interesting case because the patient came in really wanting to do an aesthetic fix. And aesthetically, he thought they were the front two teeth, maybe four teeth, maybe six teeth. He wasn't really sure. And as we went through the case, functionally and aesthetically, I can tell you that in an ideal world, we're thinking maybe eight or 10 teeth would be ideal because he shows a lot of teeth. And this starts to get into a little bit more of a costly endeavor just for aesthetics. Um, but there was a different issue there. So obviously, if you look at the teeth, you can see that the gingival architecture is short. So I'm gonna to wanna to do something aesthetically to manage the gingival architecture. That's gonna be crown line thing. Um, he has a restoration in the number nine array. And you can see there's kind of a, a black root coming through there. So you already know that there's a darkened root underneath there and that's gonna be problematic for you. But yet the nine, the eight and the um, 10 were actually fairly healthy teeth, just had gingival issues that we had to work through to get the tissue in the right position. So in the end, we started doing a diagnostic wax up. And when I waxed the case, it was interesting because looking at the patient's face and, and physicians, I actually wanted to bring the cuspids up a little bit. I felt like you had a little bit of a reverse curve of a smile. And my original, my original wax up was four, six teeth. And this is what we thought we were gonna do until we realized that if we did that, his cuspids were the first point of contact that he had when he closed his mouth. It's kind of a class three articulation. So if we touch those cuspids, we're changing him functionally. We're changing who he is. And once we do that, this really becomes a full arch and we didn't want to go there. So we decided to opt away from touching his cuspids and just focus on the four teeth. And by the way, from an aesthetic point of view, I would tell you that I always manage cases that way. I look at them where I want to do two, four, or eight, 10, or 12. I don't really like to do six teeth because of the, the color change and the deviations in the arch form. So for me, two, four, eight, 10, 12s, rather than sixes. But in this case, we couldn't have done the sixes unless we did more and we started changing the occlusal patterns of who he was. We didn't want to do that. So now the next problem was we provisionalized him and we did that by doing some crown lengthening to get the teeth in the right position. So the crown lengthening process was done that you can see here. We, laid, we raised the seven and the eight up a little bit uh, and then we provisionalized him. You also notice the prep challenges. So I have two teeth where I have a ton of space on, let's say, uh, the seven and the nine. And then I have two teeth that are very minimally invasive. And that means a, a material challenge for me and how I manage that material becomes really challenging. Again, I went through this in material selection or a few of the uh, webinars that we've done where we talk about space and how much space we have and how we fill that space with which material and, and which material works best optically to fill that space. So in this particular case, um, we're doing four teeth. I'm also doing a fifth tooth on the lower he had an issue with uh, that lower lateral, so I'll be restoring that one too. And we wound up originalizing the patient to a point where we liked it, and then let the tissue work heal, and then I fabricated five restorations, four on the maxillary, one on the mandible, 
and the restorations were made with the uh, YZ ST zirconia, the, the white zirconia, um, layered with the M9, and then two veneers that were done on refractory models, uh, also layered with the M9 material. So you'll notice the difference in the materials as far as a full coverage veneer, full coverage of veneer. And I think most of us know that these are the most challenging cases that we really work through these days is where we have lots of space and a little space and we have to kind of manage through both of them and it become challenging. And don't forget, we did a full coverage on the lower. This was also the um, ST zirconia material and layered with the M9 but obviously a different shade than the upper. I had to really blend this more into the lower teeth, whereas the upper, I was trying to brighten them up and whiten them up a little bit more to make them uh, feel right for the patient. So there's final restorations. And again, the management point in this case for me was knowing what to do and what not to do, meaning did we want to touch those cuspids or not? It was smart that we didn't, and yet we still tried to stay as minimally invasive as we possibly could to deliver what the <laughs> I won't go through the video, it just takes too much time. As we get into the next case here, this is a little different scenario. And this is dealing more with veneers and veneer preparations now. So um, this is Derek, and Derek was a patient that I worked on a few years back, and he presented for a few reasons. One, he didn't like the color of his teeth. He wanted them much whiter and brighter, and he hated having a diastema. He wanted to change the diastema. So as we look through the case, and you start to realize that um, yeah, that the diastema is going to change how we position those teeth, and the goal is not to make them look too wide, so that means we have to cheat a little bit from the mesials and distals to manage the uh, aesthetic spacing on the teeth. But in the end, it's, it's doable. Functionally, he was okay. There wasn't any major hiccups that we were concerned with, and it's really just an aesthetic fix. So first challenge here is what kind of prep do you need? for either full coverage or veneer, veneer. And for this case, I'm gonna stay, stick with veneer. Um, this is kind of a, a process that I hear a lot about over the years. And I'm gonna tell you, for me, um, I have basically two types of preparations that I like to work with. The one is if you're just changing color and you're not really changing shape or the basic form of that tooth and there's no major functional issues, and in the ideal world, it's best to really minimally reduce the tooth and only work on the facial aspect. So we're going to do maybe two to three tenths on the cervical and anywhere from three to five tenths on the facial. But you'll notice that will be the only facial reduction. There is no incisal reduction, nothing on the lingual of the tooth. And this is probably the most ideal, minimally invasive, high aesthetic that you can do by reducing very little of the tooth and still being able to change some of the form and the color of the tooth facially. Few little hiccups with this. If you're looking to bring the color from a very dark color, A3, A4, up into something 1M1 or OM3, then this won't work for restorative because you will not have the space to be able to do that. So this really only works from a minimal color change. So it means I'm going one shade or two shade differences. And the rule of thumb that I tell people is it's normally about two tenths of a millimeter per color change. So the first change that I want to make from A1 to OM3, I need at least two, maybe even three tenths of a millimeter. But every change after that, I need another two tenths and another two tenths. So if you're starting with a prep shade that's in the 835 range, um, you're going to need to be reducing six to eight tenths to get that to that A1 or OM3-ish range. So be aware of that. But in an ideal situation, this is really the best preparation that you can do. And also that preparation is really to be used for feldspathic or lifting the silicate, whether it's monolithic or, or microlayered, would be up to you. But that would be really the ultimate in preparation design. Second preparation for me, um, is what I would call kind of the standard for me with veneers. And what I mean by this is I still want a very minimal thickness in the face shell. I'm not looking to have a full millimeter of tooth reduction. I want to stay in the enamel. I want to be able to bond to that enamel. Um, but outside of that, I also need room to restore. And the restorative part for me is actually that I'm going to need about two millimeters of incisal reduction. Um, a little caveat here, just to be clear. With the first prep that I showed you, 
I'm saying you need two to three tenths gingival, or maybe three to five, six tenths facially or towards the incisal. But that is also based on tooth position, right? If the teeth are already lingually inclined, you don't need that reduction because you're bringing the tooth out. If the teeth are out too far facially, you're gonna need more reduction to get the tooth in the ideal position. So there is no set standard of always reducing this amount or that amount. It has to do with the orthodontic position of the teeth more than anything else. For this type of prep, it's the same thing. Um, do I always need two millimeters of reduction? I do if the tooth incisal edge position is already where we want to finish. But if the incisal edge position is short of where we want to finish, then I may only need to reduce the prep one millimeter or a half millimeter, depending on how much we're working to extend the length of the tooth. So I want you to kind of keep that in your mind as you're managing through your cases. And this is really the ideal prep where I basically create a flattened butt joint on the incisal edge. I don't want it wrapping over. I don't want any angulations on it. I really want it to be more of a flat, straight butt joint for us across that incisal edge. And then the facial redux reduction, again, is going to be anywhere from two tenths to six tenths based on how much uh, color change I want or how much tooth position that I'm looking to alter. These could be more, and it also could be maybe slightly less, depending on, again, coloration and tooth position that you're looking to work through. Um, the other one is where we can actually get more reduction and start to drop over the lingual. But I'm going to be honest and tell you, I don't like this. I don't ever want to see it. And I really highly encourage my doctors not to do this, not to flatten that inside the ledge position and then wrap over. The only time that this becomes a must for you is if there is some sort of decay that you have to manage or some sort of chemical or functional wear that's been taken away and you want to replace some of the material. But otherwise, I would rather not have that wrap over. It makes it difficult to impression. It makes it difficult functionally, depending on where the envelope and the lower tooth is. And it also makes it more difficult for the restoration to seat properly because of that wrap around and those sharp edges sometimes. So I try to avoid this reduction anytime we can. And then the last re reduction would be almost full coverage, but minimally invasive. And again, for me, these are, I avoid as much as physically possible. This is where you're taking away a little bit from the facial, a little bit from the lingual and the two millimeter reduction on the incisal. And the only time I think this prep is a useful preparation is in a chemical wear case. These are where the patients worn away the lingual of their teeth, either chemically or potentially frictionally or functionally, and they need to replace that enamel. And if they do, for me, that kind of changes my material selection. Um, I, I wrote here that you could put it in feldspathic. I would rather do that in the lithium to silicate material, as long as I can still bond to an enamel uh, or a lithium silicate. But again, for me, preps one and two are kind of the king. Um, three and four are, are case specific to the patient that I'm working on. The other thing that I want to always manage in these cases, and I know a lot of us talk about this, I, I hear it uh, in lectures and, and people always ask me, do you break contacts on the veneers? And the answer is yes and no. And that really depends on the orthodontic position of the tooth. If I don't have to break contact, I don't want you to break contact. I don't want your doctors breaking contact if they don't have to. But if you're changing the shape or the form, or orthodontically the teeth are a little out of position, you have no choice but to break contact. Bring your preps further back to the lingual and elbow out your preps so you can get a little bit more depth for the emergence and to cover up the, the pre-existing tooth. The other challenge here is that when we talked about before, I said I want that two millimeter of, of reduction. I also want you to be careful about where the functional attributes are here. If your lower incisal edge is hitting right where your junction is, that's not really an ideal scenario for a veneer. You might want to consider going full coverage. I don't want to be hitting right in the joints of where my finish lines are. So you need to also take that into account when you're kind of working your way through your cases. And then the last aspect of this is I said that marginal placement can really be dependent on the depth of margin, my prep of two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, and how, how low or equal low my placing that margin. And for me, that's all about the tissue type. When you're in bio one, very thin tissue, I want your doctors or, or want you to speak to your doctors in a way that you keep your 
a margin right at that gingival line, not usually more than two, three, four tenths of a millimeter below. But when you get into a thicker tissue, a thicker biotype, like bio2 or bio3, you can freely drop that margin a little bit more. But again, rule of thumb for all margins are really never more than 0.5 millimeters below the tissue. That's how you keep the most health. That's how you manage the biology and the epithelial attachment and have the ability to clean out cement as you're working through the processes of the case. So those are kind of the ideal scenario for me. And with this case for Derek, so you can see that we did all the things that we talked about. Um, the doctor did very minimal preparations on the facials and yet brought the lingual margin way back to the lingual so I could have now room to emerge that contact area and create my own contact area as I work through the process. And that's what I mean by that elbow prep, where the prep actually comes back here like an angle and then comes back up. That's that little elbow that you want to make sure you're getting inside the preparation. Uh, I did build this case with VM nine years ago, and I started this case with um, using my effect liner. So I actually used uh, an effect liner one and an effect liner three. The one was basically for the white and brightness and to extend my custom look, my incisal edge position a little bit. And then the three was just for a little bit of color and to approximately a little warmth on that cervical. The um, effect liner is very fluorescent. So that's one of the reasons I like to use that. And it also fires at a higher temperature. So doing that on veneers is a really nice, uh, a way to get a nice base for me to start from. And then it actually makes my layering a little bit easier. In my layering, I'm going to come back and, and work my normal process. And that's where I'd probably, if I'm looking for a brighter shade, which I was, I'm going to use at least two, maybe three dentins. So I use a, a dentin 1M1 on the cervical, an OM3 in the middle third, back to my 1M1 towards the incisal edge. And then as I really get towards the incisal edge, I use a transition dentin 1M1 mixed with a little bit of EE9. Sometimes I might even throw in a little EE10, depending on how much translucency I actually want from the process. Oop, I just dropped my... So, um, yeah, that would be the normal process for me for my dentin buildup. And then I would come back with some mammaline materials. And usually my mammaline materials, uh, I'm using one, two, sometimes even three of them, depending on the effects that I'm looking for. I will tell you that if um, I'm doing more color, and what I mean by more color, I'm working in the 1M1, OM, uh, 1M1, 1M2, A1, A2 family, I'm probably using two or three mammalons. When I get into the OM3s, OM2s, OM1s, those really white, bright kind of cases, I'm not using three or four mammalon materials. I kind of don't need them. I'm kind of sticking with the white or brighter. And in this case, maybe just using uh, an effect chroma, uh, I'm sorry, uh, an effect chroma one, very white and bright, and a mammalon one. So again, staying in that white or brighter family. But if I'm in warmer shades, shades 1M1, A1, A2, 1M2, that range, I might wind up going with three or four mammalon materials and using one that has a little bit more pinky, amber, or orangey colors to it to get a little bit of warmth, um, but not with bleach shades. It just kind of seems, they, they usually stand out as, as too much or too aggressive. And my buildup is always the same. I've been through this with you guys a lot over a lot of the, the webinars that we've done. I'm always looking at increasing the chroma and cervical, raising the value in that middle third, and then what is the age of the tooth and the translucencies of the tooth that I'm actually looking to work through. Uh, and I like to look at the teeth kind of this way. Uh, the cuspids is really kind of the personality of the patient. So I want them to be kind of pointy and aggressive, which I like sometimes in men and in women, depending, or they want a little softer, a little more worn, a little more natural look, depending on the age of the person. Um, the laterals are known as the gender tooth. Um, typically, male teeth are a little squarer on the laterals, but sometimes not. You might get a, a little curved distal or more rounder shape, depending on the rest of the teeth and the facial form. So they are kind of the, uh, the gender
Hey, Peter. Uh, we've lost audio. Hi, Helen. Uh, this is Jim McGuire with Vita. Uh, Hello, how are you? Good. Peter's currently doing a webinar for us. Can you can you run in and let him know that uh, he uh, his presentation was dropped that that he may need to re log in and oh, it's dropped. Yeah, and and call back in to reset it. Okay. All right. Um, no. All right. Thanks. Hi everyone, I hope uh, you can hear us. Uh, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties, so we will be having Peter uh, redial back in. And as soon as he gets back on, we will uh, hopefully resume this PowerPoint. All right, so make sure you, as you're uh, waiting, as we all are waiting for Peter to 
get back on, please uh, send us any questions you may have about any, any topic that Peter has brought up. Uh, that would be much appreciated. And again, as soon as he gets back online, we will resume this uh, program. Shouldn't be uh, too long. So please uh, let us know. I'm assuming everyone has lost their um, their presentation uh, reception when Peter dropped off. So everyone is still on, looks like. We're just waiting for Peter to get back online. Again, sorry for this uh, technical difficulty, but that's the way the virtual world is, right? So I hope everyone is well out there. The uh, questions, we're getting a couple questions in now, so I appreciate it. And we'll address any of those questions uh, at the end of the presentation. And we have uh, Peter pretty soon coming up. So we do have some other uh, webinars that will be uh, coming up. Uh, just while we wait for Peter, we do have um, a recording of this. We'll snip it, get rid of all the, uh, the downtime, and put it back together for you. But it will be uh, edited and then presented as a recording on our Vita YouTube North America channel, uh, along with uh, our other areas of uh, social media. There you are. Peter's back on, so let me... All right. Peter. Peter, you're back. Yes, Excellent. Uh, so it was about the, that was was about the time... Yeah, it was, it was about the time that you're talking about the... Um, uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, about just a, a couple before this uh, slides. Let's uh, start with that. The patient, beginning of that patient. Did we finish uh, this? Yeah. Did, it, did this uh, finish? I, I think we finished the other one. We didn't. We didn't finish this one. If this is part of it, yeah. Did, that did is I good. Tell me about where we were. Yep. Uh, about right there. Right okay. there. Yep. Sorry about yep. that. I didn't know we went oh, out. No, no problem. Not your your fault. So no worries. Let me just run through this quick because now we're going to run out of time. Sorry about that. So I went through the final of this case. I showed you the final veneers. I was showing you, but you weren't there. So where were you guys? Uh, a final placement. And again, what he wanted, kind of a whiter, brighter smile. And we planned on either bleaching or redoing the lower at some point. I don't think he ever did it. But I think you can see it's a fairly nice looking case, a simple case a whiter, brighter, you know, eight or nine powders, and following all the parameters of the biology that we just talked about, the space that we needed for color and management, and then the aesthetics that usually go into a case. Um, after that, I had jumped right into implants, and I was kind of rolling, and you guys weren't there, so I'll re-explain it. Um, what I had said was, implant-wise, should we or shouldn't we? And the first case I showed you was a difficult case because we basically had spacing issues that we had to manage through. Well, part of those issues sometimes come from implants. There's more implants placed than ever before. And we sometimes have to look at, should we be placing as many implants? I'm not sure. There are some times where I'd argue we shouldn't, and sometimes where 100%, of course you should. So I'm gonna show you a case where I've kind of argued against placing the implants on this case. Young girl that we worked on, I know, maybe 10, 12 years ago now. Uh, Jessie is her name. And what I want you to notice on this case, which is really interesting, is you'll already notice the concavities of her bone. She's already missing bone. Again, she was 14 or 15 years old at this time, and it's also 10, 12 years ago. So just to be clear, today, this would be treated much different. We would definitely be doing some bone grafting and tissue augmentation and kind of looking differently at the case if the patient wanted us to. Uh, sometimes patients refuse all the secondary surgery, so it's a different ballgame. But we wound up uh, putting her in some ortho, moving the teeth around a little bit, and creating a little bit more ideal space for the patient. At this point, when she was about 16 or 17, we actually fabricated a Maryland bridge. Um, and I, I think old school-wise, it's kind of funny because 
This is actually a six unit marilyn bridge. I have a metalingual on the cuspid, a pontic, metalingual, metalingual, pontic, and another metalingual. So it was actually a six unit metal marilyn bridge. And today I would never do that. Today, every marilyn bridge that I make has one wing on them. And we've learned that over a period of time. The reason marilyn bridges debond or, or, or de cement is really because you're putting them on two teeth. The two teeth are in ligaments that move and they, they, they help ease the cement to break away or the bonding material to break away. So I know it might sound crazy to some of you, but we've been doing one wings for four or five years now. You don't need more than that for a Maryland bridge. Um, but in the end, I would also argue that for this patient, maybe the, rather than waiting for her to turn 18 and placing implants, maybe just doing the crown lengthening, a little bit of a tissue graft, a tissue pocket graft, and sacrificing the cuspids and making cantilever restorations for the laterals might have been a better way to go. Um, maybe not, right? It's debatable that we can kind of work our way through that process. So in the end, we did wind up moving our teeth around, prepping them very aggressively, which we also wouldn't do today, uh, and, and placing two 3.0 implants, which back in those days were um, brand new to the market and didn't really have the option to restore unless you restore them from the company. So you can see the abutments were placed that were made by the company uh, with two cylinders over them that barely fit on them. They were just temporary cylinders. Um, and I can tell you that looking at this x-ray from 10 years ago, I, it kind of sends a shill down my spine. I don't know how you guys see this, but um, you'll see why in a second. So these two implants are placed and we're gonna start restoring them now. And what you should notice right away is that uh, she's provisionalized, but look at the tissue around the two implants. Matter of fact, I would argue this is worse looking than my Maryland bridge. My Maryland bridge actually looked decent uh, of where the tissue was and where we wanted it to be. So that's a concern now. And this patient's waited four or five years for their implants and their processes, and we're not making them better. So we went back and we looked at this and we realized that, again, the biology, like I started with you earlier, was a problem. Yeah, the biology from the implant to the contact wasn't an issue, but the biology of the finish line of the preparation to the adjacent root was. Uh, we violated that two millimeter biology from tooth to tooth or implant to tooth. So what we actually did was we removed those abutments and we basically ground them down, the, the custom made abutments that the company had made for us. And we made them into little thin sticks, a little thin ice cream cones, you could say. Uh, and then made new temporary cylinders for them. And you can see how we're kind of just creating some space underneath the tissue and, and allowing the bone to heal up and, and grow back the way it should. And this is just after three days of cleaning it up. Look at how much more that tissue is starting to drop already. So again, managing your case, should we have placed the implant? I'm not sure. But in the end, we wound up doing a veneer, a PFM, a veneer, a veneer, a PFM, and a veneer. Will she ever have perfect tissue? No, definitely not. She needed a graft, a bone graft and a tissue graft, but she got better tissue and it looked pretty good. And as time went on, three weeks after insertion, you can see that tissue is getting better and better and healing. Uh, and today, Jess is probably in her 20s and I think she works in the dental field still. So it's kind of nice. Everything is fake there. And again, this is what the people see and the patients see. Everything else is retracted is really for us to to learn and grow and be better with it in the end. But uh, Jesse finished to be a happy camper and it worked out well, even with all the little hiccups that we had along the way. And each of these cases are more challenging, right? Sometimes if you're building the pink and you also have to take into account of where the bone levels are and where the aesthetics are. Again, in a case like this, the patient doesn't show much of the bone. So that's kind of good because of the lip dynamic is somewhat brachial facial but I still have to manage the pink. And why do I have to manage the pink? Because even though he's brachiofacial, he's gonna need papilla in here. Papilla is 30 to 40% of your tooth. And I wanna make sure that I'm giving the papilla what it deserves because it helps to make the teeth look good. So am I doing the pink just for the fun of doing pink? Or am I doing it for lip support or aesthetic support on the white that's surrounding the pink? And in this case, it's a little bit of both. You needed the lip support, and you actually needed the pink papillus to break up the tooth monotony. Uh, old school metal frameworks, as you can see here. So this is kind of an old school case, but I still do a lot of my implants in metal, even though metal is uh, 
through the roof right right now. Uh, I still believe that metal is a great restorative option, especially on these larger implant cases, because of the flexibility and, and forgiveness of the material. So, uh, same buildup as always, chroma, value, and age is kind of the way I'm always building through my teeth. In this case, I'm going to be doing some pink restorative, and I think it was the last webinar that we did together, Jim, that I actually did a, a pink and white, so I won't go too far into the, the pink and white concepts today, but in the end, the goal here is to actually uh, create the amount of white that I need and then surround that with the pink so I can get my papillas and I can get a little bit of the lip support. And I think I told you in the last webinar that I did that I, I handle most of the pink part of this really towards the end. So you can see that I've got all my pink fired in my first and second bake, but realistically, I'm doing all my final pink right here in the final glaze bake. And that's where I like to get that final detail and contour out of the pink. I'll final glaze that. It was an older patient, so I wanted a more colorful chromatic tooth with a little bit more natural appeal to it, a little more of a masculine appeal to it. So some sharper angles on the cuspid, some flatter incisal edges along the, uh, the path there. And then we'll finish off that case and place that in the patient's mouth. And here is our final. And there he is. So he feels a little better and happy and it worked out fine. So again, now managing a little more complex case. I was gonna leave you with one long case here and try to walk through this case quickly because these are the challenges that you face along the way. So to break down what we've kind of touched on here a little bit in this short time today, and I'm sorry for the quick hiccup here, but um, biology is number one. I want to understand where the tissue belongs, where the bone support is, and what we need. Space management. Space management is going to dictate the material options for me, what I can use and how I use it. And then also material selection is going to be based off how much space I actually have to work with and the colorations that I'm looking to work through. So I'm kind of trying to classify this. This particular case kind of puts all of that into perspective. Uh, and maybe not in the best way, because this is why I say a case that everything could possibly have gone wrong had gone wrong with. So I'll just give you a little history on this case. Uh, I'm going to be calling this uh, maybe an all on five case, except the only difference for me is it's going to be all on five teeth. There's not going to be any implants here that I'm going to want to use. And why I think it's kind of comical that we're so easy to place all on four or all on five with implants but we act like we can't do it with teeth, doesn't really make any sense to me. I've done many large full mouth cases or full large cases on four or five teeth over the years. And if we can balance the occlusal and balance the spaces properly, they're very nice cases to manage the same way you're doing with four implants or five implants. But what's kind of ironic about this case is I met, met Esty back in 2014. So you're talking seven years ago today. And I remember when I met Esty, I actually met her with a doctor and two surgeons. And they had called me into the meeting because they wanted my opinion on what we should do. And I could tell you that word for word, I remember looking through Esty's charts and cases and all the things that we had. And I remember my words were back then, she has two implants placed in the eight and nine, by the way. Uh, my words were put the implants to sleep and let's make her a 10 unit metal framework bridge. And everybody looked at me like I was a little bit nuts, to be honest with you. Uh, and that was in 2014. Well, look, let's you look at the history of Esty a little bit. She started as a cleft palate child. Uh, you can see that the V-shaped arch that she had, and it's something that she's kind of spent her whole life dealing with. And somewhere around the age of, I believe, 15-ish uh, is when she had her first orthognathic surgery. So they actually cut the bone, they moved the jaw back a little bit and tried to reposition it. I believe she had a second surgery about two years later. And in the end result from the two surgeries is the buccal plate of bone never actually joined onto the maxillary facial structure. So she actually had a gap between where the bone was for the, the alveolar process and her facial bone. So created a whole new problematic situation for her. Anyway, with that said, somebody still decided to place some implants in her at some point down the road, which is pretty risky, but implants were placed. And over 15 years of her life, she's gone through five, maybe six or seven surgeries. So when I met her in 2014, she already had, I think, five or six surgeries at this point. 
which is a lot for someone to go through. And again, think about if it's you or your mom or your dad or brother or sister, and would you want to go through all those processes? Um, you can see the implants were placed. You don't have a great view here of the angle, but I can tell you right above where this implant is, is actually a hair space of where the anterior bone had never grown back or grabbed onto the alveolar process. So that was a danger area for us across the arch. You could also see that the tooth position is very facial. So even though the maxillary jaw was moved back, the lower jaw was never moved forward enough. So I would argue that the orthognathic surgeries weren't very ideal either at the time. But I could tell you that what we did at this point was we looked at evaluating where do the teeth belong in her face, right? Rule number one, where should we have that incisal the edge position? And I did a diagnostic wax up to kind of get an idea of what I think the teeth could kind of look like. And, uh, you know, orthodontically, could we have applied in the arch? No, but that would be really more of an ideal situation if we could at that point, but it really wasn't an option for us. So we did a diagnostic wax up and we're going to make our two provisionals to kind of evaluate the process. And I can tell you that these new temps went in our mouth in 2015 over the existing implants. And it wasn't too long after that that <clears throat> everything started going worse for us. So as soon as those crowns were touched and we made new provisionals, the tissue started pulling up and away. And that became more of a problem. The implant was already exposed to start with. And now we had to go back and try to regraft some bone and some tissue to cover up those implants, which by the way, I didn't want to use from day one. I wanted to put them to sleep. So we, we got that kind of managed and now she's you know three or four surgeries later. She's at surgery six, seven, and eight. And we're still trying to manage it. And you can see what a mess she's looking like, right? This is after bone grafts and tissue grafts. Yeah, we're getting the white part to look better but this isn't getting any better. So it's becoming more and more problematic. So we're gonna make a design of where we think the teeth should be. And I did that with a denture set up and an additive wax up. You can see she only has occlusion on four teeth. So bicuspid molar, bicuspid molar. That's the only area that she's really gonna to be touching on. So the occlusal management is really important for us. Uh, and in the end, we're gonna take that diagnostic wax up and transfer it to a provisional. And that provisional will become our, our prototype of where we'd like to see her new teeth. And you'll also notice that in my prototype, I'm adding pink because she needs some more pink to support that lip. And we're not doing very well with the pink we have, especially since we're probably gonna be putting these implants to sleep at this point. So provisional is made. One little management trick here is whenever I make provisionals with pink, um, this might sound a little funny, but it's true. I don't want the pink to match. I really don't want the pink in provisional world to match for us. Uh, I want it to be just a reference point for where the pink needs to be, but I don't want it to match. And the reason I don't want that to be the case is because acrylics and composites optically work very well into orally to blend into the tissue that's there. Ceramic is not as good. So if I make the first pink the provisional match too well, I'm going to have a bigger problem later on. So I purposely make it too light or too dark and just use it as a reference point. Believe it or not, though, she didn't care. She loved it. She was like, oh my God, this is great. This is everything I wanted. And all I'm doing is looking at it thinking, no, that pink is horrific. We don't like that. And she's like, no, but the teeth look so good. And she was happy. Kind of, she would have stayed right where she was after all the years of what she's went through. Uh, but we knew we could improve on that. So once we have the tooth position and the gingival position and all the things that we want, now it's time to actually get fabricated on the framework. The framework, again, was a metal framework, a large span. And the reason I went metal, not zirconia, was because I wanted the flexibility and I wanted to keep the embrasure spaces small and thin. So I had a lot of space to wrap ceramics and create more depth out of. With zirconia, I would have had to make much larger connectors Plus, it would have been very rigid, which I didn't really want because of the four teeth that were there. I like to have some movement, and I'll get a little movement out of the frameworks. So framework is opaque. I'll start the normal build-up process. I'm building this to my table, which I think I've gone through in some of the lectures. If not, maybe this is a lecture for us, Jim, about managing not only the occlusal, but the aesthetic parameters through uh, Facebook and using a table or a reference for horizontal. 
Um, so the buildup gets rolling. I'm using my opacious dentin materials, or in this case, my Chroma Plus and and um, Effect Chroma materials to start my major buildup. Kind of rushing through this now because you guys get all the buildup stuff that we've done so many times. Working in a little brightness and whiteness around the middle thirds, getting my dentin structure coming along, and then I'm going to start actually working through some of the enamels. And I'll finalize the whole case. And I can tell you that what wound up happening was I actually did ceramic margins, but when we touched the tissue on the number 10, we actually lost even more tissue. So I had to actually go back and fill that space. And I actually had to do that by adding ceramic margin material in paint, which I had to make because that doesn't really exist, to actually bring my ceramic margin material or create a ceramic margin in paint. Uh, which was another whole major challenge in this case. So in the end, here's our final framework for SD. Um, and here's what she looked like at the end. I think you can see that uh, it worked well. Does the pink match perfectly? No, it's okay. But in the big smile, uh, it works very well for her. She's really happy. And to be honest with you, I consider this a very long-term provisional for SD. Uh, my gut feeling is we'll be making her a new bridge. Uh, somewhere down the road when the tissue and the bone changes again and she's well aware of that and more than willing to go and actually I'm looking forward to it because I think we'll make it even prettier and better the next time. Uh, there was a lot of difficulties in managing this and I look back on the case from a few years ago and think of all the little things that I would have liked to have done differently to improve the aesthetics, some better embrasure spaces and some little things that could have been better. But in the end, um, Although she's pretending to be angry, she was a really happy camper. I think the case worked out well uh, for the process of what we did. And that was a pretty crazy involved case. So whether your cases are simple, single, um, simple, single veneer type cases or combination cases or full mouth cases or, or implant revolved cases, um, they all work. And by the way, you'll notice that we did put those implants to sleep and actually went in there and ground them down a little bit so they were really out of our way and we can utilize whatever was left of our tissue uh, to make it a little bit more aesthetic for us across the board. So uh, there's Estes final. And I think we're just about ah, right, one o'clock right at the time. So sorry about the little hiccup. I'm not sure what my internet cut out here, but uh, I jumped onto another site and we're back. So thank you guys for being patient. And uh, Jim, thank you. I hope uh, everything worked out okay. Yes, Kevin. I mean, the uh, just so everyone knows, sometimes even the uh, the internet itself kind of has some difficulties. So uh, thank you very much, Peter, for uh, getting back on with us and appreciate your patience when we do have technical difficulties. Um, so we've got some questions. Uh, let me, before I get to the questions, let me uh, finish up um, the presentation here as far as some last minute things that we need to uh, go over. So I'm gonna bring back my screen and we will start off with the, um, you know, CE. We get a lot of questions about uh, CE. So if you're looking for the CE on this particular uh, recording webinar, uh, you will get an email from our education uh, team that will ask you a few questions, get some information from you, and then we will get you that CE. Uh, we are, again, we have posted these webinars on our website, so please visit us uh, on the various social media websites of Vita North America. And then if you need to contact us here at the, uh, at the uh, factory, uh, there's Paul, myself, there's the help desk, we're always uh, around. Uh, we've also got a team of uh, field reps that can assist you as well, so please uh, get a hold of us. And then please join us for some upcoming webinars. We've got plenty more with Peter. You can see October 19th, November 2nd, December 2nd, and then we'll probably add some more on as Peter's schedule frees up because uh, Peter is in such uh, a large demand. So I appreciate you, Peter, uh, allowing us to work with you on scheduling these uh, webinars out with you. No and problem. I put a note, I did put a note about the occlusion as well. So maybe we'll set up a webinar talking about the occlusion, how to establish the video and um, you know other things that are important uh, as well. I 
hope you don't mind, Peter. I did put, uh, in case someone needs to get a hold of you, uh, I put your business phone, not your cell phone. Um, but, you know, information on Peter, if you do need to get a hold of him. No, not a problem. Uh, yeah, please feel free to uh, contact Peter. Uh, as far as questions go, uh, you've answered a couple of them. There are some questions that came through on the prep, uh, on the veneer prepping, the incisal edge. You went through the different various uh, preparations, one, two, three, four. But on the first one where you did the veneer uh, and just brought it to the incisal edge, the finish line, uh, the question was, do you ever slightly wrap on the incisal, or you always stop right there on that facial incisal edge uh, for a finish line. Yeah, I mean, it, again, if, if it's an aesthetic veneer and we're just facially adding or, or taking away minimally invasive and just covering the, the length of the tooth, I don't usually have a need to go over the incisal edge. It doesn't mean I can't. So let's say the tooth is, you know, a few tenths of a millimeter on the shorter side. I don't mind putting a little wrap over it. Um, but again, that has more to do with the functional capabilities. A lot of times when we're doing the facial veneers, um, sometimes we're doing them because there's functional issues, meaning that the envelope is constricted, it's a little tight, and the last thing we want to do is have to start turning around on that tooth. We want to stay more on the facial. This way the tooth has the same functional capability. Once you start wrapping, you're kind of tightening the tooth, you're changing its, its frictional form. So in an ideal world, if it's a functional concern, staying as facial as you can is usually the best, um, unless the function is so problematic that you really have to go full coverage. All right. And then there was another question about breaking the contact, which we always get, uh, but you had answered that. Um, and I think, you know, if you want to add anything more, but it was for, uh, if you have to uh, change shape or form, uh, that's primarily when you break the contact, but again, it's contingent on the, the case, correct? Yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, why break contact if I don't have to? But I still want elbow prep, meaning that as I'm coming up from the gingival, I want to get a little deeper in there, make that elbow on the cervical area, and then come back out and keep the contact. Um, but if your closing diastema is changing shape or form, you have to change the contact position. All right. On your uh, SD's case, uh, did you did you guys end up opening the bite at all? Um, I don't think we changed our vertical very much at all. If, it, if, if, if we did, it might have been minimal. And I guess I would question, did it matter, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we make a big deal out of OBD sometimes, and I don't know why. So I, mean, I, I appreciate your question. I'm not mocking it. I'm just saying, what difference does it make if we opened it or we didn't? If we did, we were going to see our position, which we always do anyway on a patient like SD. Uh, and, and I feel very comfortable tweaking it, you know, one, two, three millimeters if I need it. Um, but I don't remember if we actually went back and tweaked our vertical. Or I think I think our OBD was fine. Uh, and in truth, because SD is class two, uh, with class two patients, especially when they're class two, div two, you don't really want to open those verticals too much because they become, you know, more extreme in, in their in their uh, position. Yeah, you, you had kind of answered the uh, the follow up question to that, which was, uh, you know, if you do open the bite, uh, you know, what what generally comfortable and I, I think you just mentioned one to three millimeters sometimes but again I'm sure it's depending on what the patient can tolerate and the case design treatment planning and so forth. Yeah let, let me add to that Joe Jim and just say that look I think for some reason we make such a big deal out of opening vertical and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll go into this in another lecture at some point but you know people are very adaptive, right? And as long as you don't open them past their rotation point of their condyle, which is usually about three quarters of an inch, as long as you don't change that position where they can't open and close in a normal fashion, opening them a millimeter or two millimeters or three or four millimeters, it's not so bad. The only thing I would say to you is anytime you're opening vertical or managing through your cases is make sure you know where the CR is on the patient and decide if you're going to build them at a different vertical based on a functional concern or a facial concern. Maybe sometimes you want to lengthen the look of the face. People get collapsed, the teeth intrude. So there's nothing wrong with opening. Just know why you're doing it is really the only thing I would argue about. Uh, another question is, uh, how do you determine how to fabricate your veneers? Do you, um, in other words, uh, choose between milling 
or re your refractory? Is there a decision maker on which case works best and what fabrication method? Yeah, so I, I think in uh, it was two webinars ago we talked about materials and I, and I spent a little time on, on veneers and I showed some milled veneers in Feldspathic, by the way, I showed some veneers in, in lithium to silicate. In an ideal world, um, I like refractory. Um, I don't know if you guys know, I just found out that the GC Orbit Vest has been canceled. They no longer make it. Uh, and that's a major problem because that's the material I use. So I'm actually testing some or starting to test some new uh, refractory materials. If you guys have any good suggestions, let me know. But uh, yeah, that's going to be a problem for me. In an ideal world, I love refractory veneers. I still think they're the greatest restorative option. But I am milling some veneers. I'm using the, the Trilux and the Mark II for that, mostly the Mark II. Um, and, and I love the Mark II that I can mill feldspathic ceramic and layer ceramic on it. So, or keep it as monolithic for very thin, you know, if I'm just doing that facial veneer, it's three tenths, what am I gonna layer? So I can mill that, colorize it, glaze it, and, and just bond that. So um, I try to stay more feldspathic in my veneers, either milled or refractory. I do do lithium silicate and desilicates, but usually always layer those. Uh, at least micro layer but for me in the ultimate world for me refractory fully layered veneer i think is the ultimate restoration today still so another question is have you fabricated veneers out of zirconia before i mean the, the, there's a tendency we're getting more buzz out there people starting to use zirconia for veneer work but i i have not for a few reasons um one optically look let's Let's be blatant and say zirconia, lithium silicate, and desilics are good materials, but optically, they're not the greatest materials for light. We have to kind of manipulate them, stain them, colorize them, change them, or layer them to really make them do something somewhat aesthetically useful. That's one challenge. Second problem is, and I know you guys are probably hearing the studies that are telling you that um, lithium, that zirconia is etchable. Yes, it is etchable if you etch it for 30 minutes and that changes the, the crack propagation of the material and that becomes problematic. And even after you etch it for 30 minutes, is it really a great bondable material? My answer is not today. It won't be for a while. So I don't know if I get the reasoning that we're dying to make a zirconia veneer. It doesn't do anything for me uh, besides create more challenges at this point. So I'm gonna tell you that as of today, I have no interest in zirconia veneers. Um, down the road, you might hear me say something different as the materials keep evolving. But right now, I have feldspathic, lithium silicate, and lithium desilicate, and I could layer on all of them or mill them monolithically, and that's a lot of options for me. And that's key, right? Our industry is constantly changing, so what we say today may not be true for tomorrow, or we sometimes go back to yesteryear and traditional work that makes continues to make sense so well you know um, on what you just said there which is interesting is i think i always say we get a lot of phone calls from doctors around the country who want to send work and i have to tell you one of the first things they always say is i hear you do refractory veneers and they're always interested in that because let's be realistic everybody's milling monolithic lithium silicates and desilicates we're all getting a very similar look in the veneer world today. So being able to differentiate, um, make yourself different in the market, I think is really important. Yeah, and definitely. One more thing, I'm sorry, I'm gonna add one more thing yeah. to that. Um, I hear all the lab owners tell me, nobody can layer it today. That's a big gripe I hear. And my only argument to that would be, so you mean to tell me that technicians walking off the street and they could pick up a mouse and design in software like nothing? Or did you teach them that? And the answer is you teach them how to design. You could teach them how to put a brush in to play it too. So it's a matter of how we, we develop it. Yep, it's back to on the job training uh, for our industry it seems. So Peter, I appreciate uh, your time. Uh, thank you the audience for joining us and hanging in there uh, during our technical difficulties. Uh, as I mentioned, this will be recorded. We will, Peter, uh, to make uh, myself look better, we're gonna edit the, uh, the video before it's posted. Uh, give us a day or two and we will have your video 
post it so that you can revisit it. The CE will be on its way as soon as you bounce back some information, uh, everyone who attended. Uh, Peter, any last words before we uh, call it a day? No, sir. Thank you. I, I appreciate all of the input and uh, the people attending and always the, the emails and feedback I get afterwards. Thank you. Look forward to seeing more of you. I know I've been starting to travel again and have some dates coming up in September. So uh, I think we're going to be in Canada too, right? And I've yeah. Over, been in a long time, so I, I miss my Canadian friends too and uh, look forward to it. So thank you guys. Hope to see you soon and please feel free to follow up with any questions that I can help with. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today on the Vita Learning Webinar. We appreciate uh, Mr. Peter Pizzi's, uh lecture. He always provides us with a great depth of information uh, that we can actually use, which is uh, a relief, right? I mean, you, you provide everyone with usable information, not just glossy pictures, but how to achieve and why to achieve. And that's, we're all here to learn. Thank so you, I'd like to thank again, uh, Peter and the audience for joining us. Uh, this concludes another Vita Learning Webinar. Have a good day wherever you may be. Thank you. Take care, everybody.